Welcome to ATV TV. I'm Darren Dance with Peter Morganti. Welcome to the 1st of October. Spring is well and truly in the air, Pete. This weekend we've got Turnbull Stakes, which we'll talk about. It's a cracking race. Um, we've got the Bar Cummings, of which we've got a little smoky in there. And you know Spring's here when the first two-year-old race, the Meribyrnong Trial, and I'll tip in that race, Pete, that we'll let go. And then you've got one. Stay tuned and uh, join us with our punting. You too can lose your money. Anyway, yeah. back to it, Pete. Um, let's have a look at uh, last week's runners. Righto, we uh, head overseas, Darren, to Listable, where Melbourne ran what I would say was a very unlucky fourth. Um, the stewards here in Australia would have had a, well, it would have been one jockey at least got 10 weeks. Oh, hell, he got cut. She <laughs> got cut in half, about 200 from home. Well, I mean, I thought clearly the horse should have won. Um, it got knocked over twice in the run. And uh, we, I don't know, it's a split screen and they don't actually show the whole race but on the replay. But, oh, I, I text the trainer and said, what is wrong with the, your Irish people over there? Don't you protest? Does, does someone have to fall off the protest? Because in Australia, you know, we've seen what's happened here. There would have been protests, stewards protests, inquiries. And people would have got time, as you said, but no, we just get on with it. Well, Craig Williams, intimidation. You lose a race with intimidation over here. Uh, anyway, and and like for a start, to cop that interference, she did well to just maintain her run to the line rather than, you know, spat out the back. And yeah, she had to go back to the rail. And yeah, anyway, he was close to the mark, though. He did give her a good chance. Look, it was a good run, and um, like he said to me, she's a mare with a ton of ability, but she's just got soundness issues. Um, you know, if you if you gallop her on a firm surface, you know she can't run for a month. So you got to you got to make sure you only gallop her when there's rain. She can only race when there's rain. Um, she's a very frustrating filly because he knows that she stakes level. But trying to keep her in one piece and trying to look after her um, and, and then trying to get her to pay away and have a bit of fun at the track, it's, you know, it's probably like trying to juggle eight golf balls with both eyes shut. So, you know, it, it's pretty hard. So, look, I take my hat off to him. He's been patient. Um, you know, she, she ran enormous. And, uh, yeah, we were unlucky not to win. You know, he's got a plan to try and race her again in three weeks. Um, I suppose they're coming into their winter months over there now, so we are a, a chance of getting another wet track. And, um, you know, we've got her in the November sale, but like he said, it's hard to sell a filly you know goes so good, um, but it's hard to keep it because it costs so much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, we'll have another crack in about three weeks' time. Uh, we move on to Caulfield last Saturday with Mr Moneybags was second up over 1,400 now. Once the rain came, I think we knew we were in trouble. Not that we went there as a winning chance, but it was just hard to get a gauge on his run in the end. He finished 13th, beat a long way. Yeah, yeah. look, um, I've got to be honest, I was probably disappointed overall. Um, I just felt that, um, you know, the horse is really coming back from injury. I think he was second up. His first up run was good. Uh, really, you know, got galloped off his feet early and ran on good in his first up run. But the other day, I just felt with the big weight going forward, hunting him up on a wet track, was always going to leave him to stop and, um, you know, run out the back. So, you know, I just thought maybe he would have been better off just running his comfort zone and then just having a chance to being somewhere midfield or near the end, you know, near the finish. Um, you know, I just think, um, you know, it just showed us and told us nothing. And, um, you know, we're, we're back at square one now. So now he's, you know, we're trying to get him in the um, Country Cups race in Melbourne um, over the carnival. And he's going to have a run at Geelong. Um, you know, so he's really got to win that um, to make the field. I think you've got to run top two to get in. And, you know, if you can't do that, then I don't know where we're at. Yeah, well, he lost two rating points too. So he's gone from a uh, 81 to 79. And I think it's a benchmark 90, the race, the grand final. So you slip 
bit aged. Yeah, so the Geelong race, the Geelong race is a seventy-eight, I think. Yep. So he's going to have to carry sixty-one and a half there. Um, look, for all I know, it could be a rock-hard track by then. Um, and as you say, if he doesn't win that race and get the points, um, then you know we're probably in trouble for the final. So I'm just not sure, you know, whether we're going to get where we want to get here with this horse or whether we need to go to Plan B. Yep, no, I agree. Um, uh, Thursday, as we sit here, yesterday, Wednesday, Cracker Jack Prince. Um, look, I think we're all disappointed we didn't win, but you can't be disappointed in the horse's performance running second. Yeah, well, you and I discussed this at length yesterday, and I know it, I asked you and I discussed it at length as well. Um, I think, yes, we all walked away disappointed with the result. Um, things didn't go our way. Um, the horse ran enormous, but unfortunately for us, uh, the horse jumped too well and there was no speed, no one wanted to lead. So he had no choice but to lead and that's not what we want to be doing, he's a chaser. And, um, you know, we were forced to lead and then we'll, we were sitting shot really and in the straight, because of the way the race panned out, we were stuck on the worst part of the going and, um, you know, no jockey's going to push out wide and risk suspension coming into the spring. So, you know, he had to hold that line. We know that inside of Ballarat's always slower. And you could tell by the kickback, he was kicking back more than the others. And the winner came down the centre. And the winner's a very, very good horse. Don't get me wrong. It'll go to the derby and be competitive. But I don't think you saw all the best of Cracker Jack Prince. I think you saw the best of the winner. I don't think you saw the best of Cracker Jack Prince. And I think if you reverse the runs, if we miss the start half a length and come from back, I'd almost say that uh, if you reverse the runs, you reverse the result. Now, some people might think I'm in dreamland saying that, but um, I really do think next time. And the good thing with Archie is he walked away thinking similar. So we're going to press on with the program and, and he'll go to... Uh, a lead-up race for the Derby in Melbourne, and I guess that'll prove um, whether we are on the right track or we're uh, looking through road colours, road rose-coloured glasses, Pete. They're the ones. <laughs> yeah, look, you wouldn't have thought when we drew five and the other favourite drew one. There's no way you would have thought we were leading and it would get to the outside of us. But that's just the way racing can unfold, and, and it was to the detriment of our chances, unfortunately. Righto, that's our runner. So we had a good second and uh, an unlucky fourth and a, and a jury out on money bags. But uh, um, we now have one, two, potentially four runners coming up. We're going to start with, I'll just change hats, Darren. Just change hats. Was me Southern <laughs> France hat, now it's the South Pacific hat. Talk about him first, the Bart Cummings. The golden ticket into the Melbourne Cup. Can a 50 to 1 chance do it? Well, form says no. Um, his last two runs say no. Um, on on, exp on what, it, what everyone's seen, you'd say, you know, he can't win, can't run in the first half. But as we said earlier, Pete, um, the, all the top liners have gone to the Turnbull because most of them have qualified for the Cup and... They want to run without getting a penalty. So they're in the turmoil because there's no penalty associated with that race. If you win the uh, Cummings, um, you're going to get weight and you're going to get points. So um, the horses in the Bar Cummings are trying to get into the Melbourne Cup or make sure they get into the Melbourne Cup. So it's a, it's a list of hopefuls in a lot of ways. Um, now we're 50 to 1 and uh, we're 50 to 1 because we put in a couple of pretty ordinary runs. But the horse has had genuine excuses for those runs. And uh, he's been switched from Caulfield to Ballarat and catching up with uh, Dec Lamar and Johnny Allen on Tuesday after he'd had his final gallop. Uh, they were very, very optimistic that uh, the horse has turned the corner. Uh, he's enjoyed being on the treadmill. He's enjoyed uh, the treatment he's had with the uh, chiropractic work that's been done on him. He's enjoyed living outside. Uh, he's muscled up, he's strengthened up, he's a lot freer in his action. And probably what's really important is the blinkers are going on. 
And uh, his last piece of work with the Blinkers was very, very sharp. So they are confident he's going to run a good race. The fact that we've had a little bit of rain through the week and the track's going to have the fire and heat out of it, I think brings him right into the race. Most of these Europeans seem to just appreciate being able to just get their toe into the ground. I don't know, as we sit here Thursday, where the track's at, but I know we've got a couple of warm days. So I'm thinking it's going to start off a four. It may get back to a three, but it certainly won't have the fire in it. But I think he's a really <clears throat> sneaky place chance if, if he runs up to everything they've told us and everything they've seen at home. If he brings that to the racetrack, um, he could sneak into a place at 15 to 1, and certainly we know at his best he's got the ability to beat these horses. Totally agree. And I reckon if you had the form line and you could eradicate, especially that last run, his first two starts, Caulfield ridden back in the field, ran on strongly. Then the next run at Flemington ran on really strongly with the winner. The winner just had a better turn of foot. Ollie sat up outside the leader in a slowly run race, which I don't think suited him either. So I reckon if you eradicate that run, he'd probably be a 12 or 15 to one chance going into it. So, and obviously they've tinkered with where he is and all that. So I, uh, I think he's a great each way chance, probably place chance more than each way. And like you said, his best form beats most of these. Um, but that's a little question mark. Yeah, and I guess, the real question, Mark, is, is there going to be any speed on in this race, Pete? You know, what is, who's going to lead? Because there doesn't appear to be, you know, Roland Garris goes forward and that uh, Chabot and Hakey go forward. But do they go forward and take a sit or does someone actually say, let's make this a true staying test because that's what we need? And we've seen a lot of these staying races where they, they just sit on them and uh, sprint the last 600. It makes it really hard to come from behind. I've got a theory that there's a warnable trainer here that has two, a uh, warnable trainer, Ballarat trainer here has two in the race that uh, there might be, I'm not saying pacemaker, but there might be genuine speed uh, in the race for the sake of one other, the top weight. And Hakey likes to roll forward. Um, so yeah, you just want you just want an even tempo, and the best star generally wins there. We just want to yeah, we want a proper race. We just want an even race, and if we're good enough, we win. If we're not good enough, we don't win. But you know, anyway, we'll just have to wait and see. But I'll be nervous. I'll be nervous for the first eight hundred if they're starting to walk. If he does win, we'll we'll get some real hats done up, not just uh, <laughs> masking tape. Um, well, I think if we, I think if we had some South Pacific hats made now, Pete, no one would really want them. <laughs> no, we better wait, wait a day or two. Sunday at Kitan, I don't know whether this girl will go around, Madam Mischief, because uh, obviously the owners know uh, the idea was to get her out a little bit further in trip, so that the tempo is not as hot for her. She settles um, and see if we can get her to extend out. But she's drawn tw eleven of twelve at Kitan in a benchmark sixty-four, so. Need to speak to Archie. I'm not sure whether it's the best option going forward with what we're trying to do. Yeah, well, I agree. I mean, when you've when you got a horse that's looking for a soft lead, you're not really looking for barrier 11 at Kitan. No. And uh, also, um, when you look at the rain forecast um, that's due, I'm not sure when that big band, uh, this La Nina event of uh, 50 to 70 mils is going to hit. But if it, um, if it hits before Sunday night, it will... We'll have you racing anywhere, I wouldn't have thought. So um, there's a lot of rain forecasts. So we'll just have to we'll see. But, um, yeah, she's she's racing for a future, that filly. And, you know, it'd be nice if she had drawn one or two and we could just pop into the lead and go. But I'd be happy for her to be scratched and safe for another day so we do get a true measure of where she's at rather than jumping from 11 and hoping um, and then kind of walking away going, well, that didn't work and we don't know whether it was the gate or her. Absolutely. Yep. Um, Monday, no runners. Donald on Tuesday, we could have a couple. Now, one well, just is Periscope, who obviously has gone through a, a big, not well, so big, but a rehab program after oh, six to eight months in the paddock. Uh, now with Pat Ryan, he's going to, he said he's very fit, going to kick him off over 2,000. We'll need the run, but um, he's had a basically an uninterrupted prep to this stage. So, this is the horse that ran second to Vow and Declare about two years ago. 
If this horse goes to the races and wins first up over the 2,000, I'm going to refer to Pat Ryan as Aidan O'Brien. And um, I've got more chance of winning first division in Tasslotto Saturday night than that horse has got winning first up over 2,000. Pat's words were at Coleraine the other day that, uh, uh, and, and the jockeys, which was Chris Caserta, that uh, as soon as you relax on him, He'll just do what he has to. So I'm thinking that Pat's trying to get as much race fitness into him as he can quickly. He's talking Jerry, Jericho Cups and all those. So he's got a plan, Darren. He's got a plan. I just wonder if he's got the horse's name mixed up with someone else. But um, they say as soon as you drop your hands on him, he just stops dead, dead straight, is he? Yeah, he just goes to... So that's it. Don't want to do anything. Caserta said he had to wake him up four times in a 1,400 metre trial. So. I see they got a name. I see he's got a stable name on his stable door there from the video they sent the other day. <laughs> what is it? Morganti. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, he's running, I'm not. <laughs> anyway, we'll move on from that, Morganti. He'll never win a race. <laughs> Street baby, I go to Donald over 1,350. Now, I love this little step out from 1,200. Uh, she was good at Ballarat first up. Her last 100 was the best. Um, I think she's got to tick the box with a gallop tomorrow before Daniel decides whether he accepts. I just can't wait to get her out to a mile on a decent-sized track, and if she can go to the races over a mile third up and be ready, she'll be, you know, she'll get a chance to show us what she can do. I think she's... I think she's a filly who's got a bit of talent. Um, you know, she's just a bit quirky, a little yeah. bit hot, um, does a few things wrong, like doesn't eat. Um, but I think if you can get her right um, and get her the races and be happy with her, yeah, she's, she's got a good win in her. I can vouch that her stable day would be more candy if she doesn't eat. <laughs> um, yeah, it won't be Darren either. <laughs> We had a couple other nominations. My shiny choice was nominated for there, but he's going to a $100,000 series race at Cranbourne, which is the following weekend. Connery, the same. He's going to Hamilton the following weekend. And I think he's in a similar 100... I think it might be the same series. The $100,000 qualify the country-based horses for where Mr Moneybags is potentially heading. So we're aiming no, no. high. <laughs> Raymond and I, all right, they've all got those dollar signs in their eyes. Poor yeah. old owners, we just want to win a race, Pete. We don't really, we're not that focused on the dollars. We're focused on getting a win. Drivers are thinking about their 10%, I reckon. If you want the quickest answer ever, just ask the owner what 10% of certain prize money is. They come <laughs> out with it just like that. Um, yeah, so that basically winds us up. We've, that's where we are with our runners. Um, not much more to add. Now, you were busy yesterday, Pete. I was busy. You are busy yesterday in the office there, um, mucking around on the website. Um, you better tell everyone what you're doing. Swearing at myself a lot. I know that. No, we've got the yearlings up and about on the sales page, Darren. We've got three. We've got a Palantino, a Tyson Stardom, and a Jukebox. So a bit of variety, a sprinter, and sort of middle distance to sort of 2,000 metre types. Um, all up, all ready to have a look, and all ready for you to go and buy shares. So, um, well, they're all, they're all they're all our homebreds. Um, now that's it. That they are the th only three that will be offered this side of Christmas. So if you're waiting for us to put more up, uh, there won't be any more. Um, they are the three we're um, offering this year. Now they're all really well bred horses. We've selected them for syndication. We've selected them to race on. They've all got good families behind them, whether it be you know, out of a half sister to Falago, or out of a, you know, a half sister to uh, La Passe, or Social Spin, or um, you know, one of Diva was a good horse in her own right. Um, she won at Mooney Valley, and she's out of um, the Rockalicious family. Yep. So these yeah. are really, really nice horses, and uh, they're all going to. Uh, well, all our trainers, we've got good trainers, so we've we've had to select three trainers for these, and we've done that. So. If you haven't had a look or you're wondering what's going on, um, you won't see us advertise any other horses. Uh, it'll be just these three this year. Um, but 
nice horses and um, they're on the website, on the for sale page. I think everyone here would have got an email. So, you know, I think they'll, they'll get traded fairly quickly. Pete, the prices are pretty reasonable. We've kept them down to a reasonable level given COVID. And, um, you know, we're happy to entertain payment plans for those who want to discuss that line. Um, but uh, have a good look and um, I'm sure there'll be something there for everyone. Yeah, roughly 13 to 14 shares or 15 shares in most of them. So good opportunity to get a, in involved in some nicely bred um, yearlings. Yeah, Ta I've taken a bit of interest in the jukebox, actually, just having a quiet look. Well, well, well they, they tell me in your heyday you were a bit of a jukebox fan, Pete. You put a few coins through, I don't know if they were pennies or 20 cent coins. <laughs> I roll into the 20 cent stage, Darren. You uh, wouldn't have seen me I on the dance. Time I, <laughs> time I come along, they were dollar, dollar coins. <laughs> you wouldn't have seen me on the dance floor. You wouldn't have seen me on the dance floor, though. I would have been watching well, from I the reckon, bar. Hey? <laughs> I don't know. I reckon um, you cut a pretty mean figure back in the day you did. Oh, Jesus. That's back in the day. That's a long time ago. Speaking of I know, horses, I've got, got, got a picture here somewhere of you holding the Melbourne Cup, and I reckon you would have turned a few heads in your day. Melbourne Cup or a, or a... I think it was I think it was a Melbourne Cup. Jesus, oh, yeah, right, eh? <laughs> I'm just saving that for another day. That for right, eh? Right, eh? <laughs> um, move on, time talking about the Turnbull Stakes and how good a field that is. That is the race that everyone needs to tip in this week, Darren, for our tipping competition. That's what we're doing. Yep, that's the group okay. one. We ended up with 131 entries, 66 yep. tipped Russian Camelot. So I can't, oh. I can't believe what the other 65 were doing. <laughs> well, given, I guess, you know, given it was a, it's a 3 2 1 point thing, 4 2 1 we went in the end. Oh, 4-2. Yeah. So, you know, like if you tip Humidor at run second, you still get two points. Yeah. Uh, those elimination comps, you've got to play every week, don't you? Yep. No, that's right. And no, if we'll... you didn't play week one, that's it. So, all right, well, let's have a look at this field, Pete. Um, so the favourite at the moment is very elegant at 440. Um, I'm just trying to work out what percentage of the tipsters are going to go very elegant. What percentage is going to go surprise baby? And then you've got Master of Wine. That, there's only, oh yeah, and then you've got Finch's, Finch and Superstorm. So it's pretty open. Like there's four under $10. Yeah. Um, so there's not going to be 50% going for one horse this week, is there? We were basically offering $2, about a dollar fifty chance last week with the Russian Camelot. So yeah. I'm uh, I'm leaning towards Hawks with Master of Wine. Hawks. Master of Wine. Third right. up. Oh, I, I thought Surprise Baby, but off camera you put me off. That could be a <laughs> deliberate ploy. I'm just thinking um, he's thinking one race there with that horse, but obviously good enough to win it. Yeah, well, I don't know how come. I can't. I don't know why Superstorm's so short. Looking at its form, yeah. Um, gee, I don't know. I I really don't know. I mean, very elegant. Yeah, it's hard. It's a star. I don't know how many. Anyway, this one will be interesting. This will be interesting. But I reckon. Um, I reckon. What is it? Fourteen in the race or sixteen in the race? Yeah, fifteen. Well, it'd have to be. I reckon we'll get twelve or thirteen different selections amongst the whole group this week. I mean. There's a lot of chances. I think I, I just got a feeling. I got a feeling that if uh, very elegance to get beat, it's going to be by a ruffie. Yeah. Yeah. No. Look, Finch, Dango, Cruz. Okay. Question is, are we brave enough to tip a ruffie in a tipping comp? Well, I reckon if you're going to do it, this is probably not a bad weekend to do it because there's a lot of chances, and you might just be able to sneak a few extra points on some. Um, but anyway, I've declared my hand, Master of Wine. I'm just, gonna have to work out, I'm just gonna have to work out which two trainers I ring up and try and get the inside word off. Yeah. Waller's, Waller's got half the field. Um, we don't have a horse there. Danny O'Brien's got one. We've got a horse there. He's got two in. We can ask him, I can ring him. 
Yeah. I can ring. Uh, I can ring Pushka, and I can ring Price. The rest of them won't answer the phone or know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, All right, we, uh, last week's tipster, Mister Eustace, steered us into the Friday night special, which wasn't quite as no. special. Holyfield. No, it got beat. Red second. Look, he hasn't been far away with his defeats, but I think it's time to put him on the interchange bench, Darren. So he's been flicked. The well, they, they, did, they, did, they did send me a sneaky for uh, Saturday. Oh, did they? Yeah, right, they right. did tell me there was one there. In, um, he's got a two-year-old there on uh, Saturday in the first race. It's paying eight bucks. It's called Fake Love, Pete. Fake Love? Fake Love, number 11. Oh, that's an I'm Invincible Philly. I did see it yeah. through the trial somewhere. Yeah. Right, eh? So, well, apparently, uh, the reports on it are uh, outstanding. Yeah. Well, I'll go head to head with Dave. He can have his I'm Invincible Philly, fake love. I'll go to the other end of the race meeting. And I'm yep. not, not declaring, I'm not declaring, but I'm saying uh, Luna Fox of Paul Pushkas, the top weight at 10 to 1 each way. That's my tip. Uh, 10 bucks, Luna Fox now. That's, uh, he hasn't had that horse that long, has he? Terry O'Sullivan had it, had it. And I reckon Terry won the, what's the 14, the 1400 metre race with it going back when he, uh, for the, yeah, won a 1400. Yeah, the produce, size produce or something like that. Yep. It is ready to win. $10 each way, you'll get something back. That's my tip. And when you go on head to head against Danny O'Brien and D. Oliver on uh, Young Werner, I tell you what, talk about good combinations. Is there a better combination in racing at the moment than O'Brien and Oliver? Absolutely flying anywhere. I see last... percentage would have to be mid twenties. Oh, I'd have to have a look, but it'd be flying. I mean, they were at sale last Sunday winning races. The combination, they're in town winning races all the time, like. Um, considering where Danny was, say, what, two years ago to where he is now, um, well, he's our leading trainer, basically. I mean, along the same lines with Kieran and David, they're out and out ahead of everyone else, I would say, for numbers as well as winners. And Willie Pike, um, he's, he's come over here and ridden like he's ridden here all his life. Yeah, W. Pike, the, what they call him, the wizard. The wizard, you said you told me to get on his bike. I want to get him on one day and I'm going to replay that. <laughs> well, when we run out of traders, we might have to get a few of these bloody uh, height deprived little fellas. <laughs> Speaking of one, he beat us. When... Yeah, I know. Yandel, imagine him on here. We'd have to hit the mute button every 10 words. All right, is that it? Oh, let's, 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 uh, give a cheerio oh, to John yeah. Marnie. He had a big birthday, Pete. 70, John yeah. 70, but I reckon he was on a few years ago and we told him about his 70th then. <laughs> the someone else I'm had sure a he's been, he's been 70 for a while, John Money, hasn't he? Uh, well, it must roll because there's someone in this household who reckons they turned 35 on Monday. Beck. She's not 35. 35. I call a plus 10. Mass is not a strong point? No, not at all. <laughs> anyway, I'll let her roll with the fact that she thinks she's 35. Well, we, Liz and I had a birthday today. It's all right. It's a family show. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, today, October 1, 26 years ago, we moved into Manning Tree Park. Oh, right. Eh? There you go. 26 years today, Pete. And I'm still building. <laughs> I was just going to say, we got the before and after shot because I have seen a bit of a before shot. Yeah, no, I, we've, uh, yeah, 26 years today since we moved in here. Who would have thought, eh? I don't, know where that, I don't know where that 26 years went. <laughs> I don't know where five or six of it went, the last five or six, but no, no, 26 years, there you go. Yeah, today, so um, well, yeah, we'll forget a bottle of champagne out. Yeah, well, we can do that. It's only 2.23, it might be a bit early, but anyway. No, I've got to go and dig a drain when I'm done here. Got to go and dig a drain, Pete, for the rain. Yeah, well, 
All anyway, right. All good. All right. Well, I guess uh, we'll leave it there, Pete, and uh, wish everyone out there a, a good weekend. I think um, Saturday the weather's going to be great, and then uh, Melbourne Spring is going to turn to wet and wild. Uh, hopefully no snow this week, but uh, forecasting 50 mils, and I think we've got seven or eight foals due in the next uh, two or three days. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be busy enough. I took some photos yesterday and sent them out to the owners. Some of those mares are massive. Same one. Um, massive. So uh, anyway, so far so good with all the following. And um, yep, by uh, next week, hopefully, we've broken the back of it. So until next yep. week, enjoy Flemington Racing. And I was pleased to see the email come out yesterday, Pete, that uh, the VRC are trying to get 10,000 to the Melbourne Cup Carnival. So um, hopefully, um, hopefully we have a few runners. And uh, for those who want to know what our likely runners would be, I think Gamay's a likely runner. South Pacific's a likely runner. It's looking more and more like Southern France could pop up somewhere Flemington week. He's, he's really going well. Um, our two-year-old yeah. exceeding so uh, gone to the paddock. Um, Serious Cracker suspect. Jack Prince, Cracker Jack Prince for the Derby and Serious Suspect for Cup Day. So we've probably got half a dozen that we know of right now that could, and then we've got 38 horses trying to get the 12 spots in the ATB country race. Looks like no yeah. other horses are going to get there, Pete, because <laughs> this is going to be an ATB race because every trainer is trying to get them there. We'll have to have eight different coloured caps with all the fluoro, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should just uh, pay for race nine and uh, make it, you know, as a, a charity race and just have eight ATV horses running down the straight at the end. That'll do. We'll fill the 10,000 spots then with the owners. <laughs> That's it. Hey, and also, uh, next week. at the back of this, we've got Mitch Friedman too. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, we interviewed Mitch earlier. Um, I've got a lot of time for Mitch. Um, I like the way he goes about it, Pete. Um, I just like the way he goes about it. He's, he's hands-on. Um, he's a horseman. Probably cares more about the horse than his family and his owners. <laughs> um, I'm sure Jenna would agree with that. But, um, no, I've got a lot of time for the bloke. He's come through the right school. He's got the right attitude towards it. And I think he's a trainer on the way. He's going to make it. And um, I hope you enjoy the interview that Pete and I did with him earlier. But until next week, I'm Darren Dance with Peter Morgandy signing off now. Cheers. See you guys. Welcome to ATB TV. I'm Darren Dance here on Friday, October the 1st. And uh, with the usual suspect, Mr. Peter Morgandy, um, he's out on bail. And we've got our special guest from Ballarat, uh, one of the young guns from Ballarat, um, well known to everyone in the ATB ranks, Mitch Friedman. Welcome, Mitch. G'day Darren and Morgs, nice to join you, um, sun's out and uh, spring's in the air. Yeah, well we're heading into the big time of the year and I'm going to ask you about your spring prospects later on, so I'll give you a little bit of time to think about that, but um, pleasure to have you on board and um, I've been really fascinated with your little insights into your operation, the videos you've been doing. I think um, the general public really enjoy those. So credit to you and the team for doing that. You've obviously got an IT guru there somewhere, um, which I might have to send Peter around for a few lessons shortly. Anyway, Pete, I'll hand over to you. Well, you had all the questions, Darren. I'll pull it up, man. <laughs> right, hey, Mitch, you've been training... Uh, these are in exact numbers. Five or six years, you uh, coaching 200 winners. Um, a move from Warnall to Ballarat, where you currently are now. How do you rate? Obviously, you've had uh, multiple city success and stake success, nearly Group 1 success. How do you rate where you sit now, um, the Mitch Friedman stable? Um, we're probably undergoing a rebuild at the moment. Um, if you talk about it in footy terms, um, it's a bit in, uh, out with the old and in with the new. We've probably gone the hardest at the, the yearling sales and, and uh, gone out and, and sourced as many horses as we can as young horses. So just that, probably that quieter season, a little dip we're going to have, uh, but we've sort of got 30 to 40 uh, young or two-year-olds now coming through our system. So it's just in that rebuild phase, but i um, happy to do it. Um, you know, I think that we showed last year that uh, 
we can compete on the big stage and um, it's certainly important to get those young horses into the system, bring them through your system and uh, hopefully it can be a fruit, fruitful sort of thing for you. And a passionate Geelong supporter, you might be able to hand that template over to uh, Mr. Scott after this final series. Oh, he's probably working on the Chris Waller template, I reckon. He's always getting these older stars in there and uh, flying the flag. But uh, look, um, you know, uh, I just think you need to do it every now and again. You know, we probably did it three years ago and, and we're doing it again now. So, um, it's uh, yeah, it, it, it worked for us last time and uh, I was happy to butter up and do it again. I thought, um, Mitch, um, I just talked to you about part of your earlier career. I think the first time I met you um, as a trainer, you were, well, you might not have even been a trainer, you were walking around leading this uh, grey horse down at uh, Wongoom Lodge and I must have been dropping something off for Weary. Um, you're a trainer in your own right. Most trainers pick up different skills from different people. Um, obviously, with a you know a long association with Darren Weir and coming through that setup, how, how how do you feel you've shaped yourself as a trainer? And yeah, you know, where where did all the inspiration and all the different ideas and methods come from in your you know that that brings you together as a trainer in your own right? Yeah, um, look, uh, shaping me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, come through um, obviously Darren Weir and, and also spent a long time with Andrew Payne. Now, that probably early days taught me a lot about sort of the horsemanship sort of stuff. Um, you know, and, and it's about uh, sitting back and, and taking note. And um, and then, you know, when I started in that Warnable role, I was basically handed the reins of, of um, you know, horses that didn't have a great ability initially, but they, they slowly stepped up in ability and, you um, and, uh, you know, as I said, you're handed the reins and, and uh, you just sort of start to play around a little bit, follow a basic template, play around a little bit, find out what worked. And it's like anything else, it's trial and error. And, and then obviously establishing your own brand and, and your own way of doing things. In terms of attention to detail, hands-on, we, we see a lot now of uh, trainers with five and 600 horses around the country and big teams and partnerships. Um, yeah, by those standards, you're a smaller operation, but your strike rate's really good. Do you put that down to the fact that you're there every day, day in, day out? I think you still write a bit of work yourself. And what do you put it down to? Yeah, I, I mean, I write work sort of every day now. Uh, there are times if I have an injury or, or whatnot that I, that I won't. But, um, you know, we've got sort of between you know, 50 and 60 horses in training at any one time and, and up to 54 at our own base. So I ride uh, anywhere between three and, and 10 horses work a morning. So um, it is that attention to detail. I'm not sure how much bigger I want to get. Um, I like being hands-on with the horses. And certainly if I did get bigger, I'd need more people around me to uh, handle the, the probably the racing manager side of things and and, uh, and that sort of stuff because um, at some point you've got to go home and, and see your kids and uh, and do things outside of racing. Agree, hundred percent. Just when you when you ride one of those horses, do you actually get that feel of how well it's going and whether you think it's ready to go to the races. How, how do you describe that to the owners? Um, I'm really big on riding the, the young horses. I, I really, um, I've got a real passion of bringing those young horses into the stables as yearlings, you know, and just seeing them, whether you buy them as yearlings or you sent them, sent, sent them or they've been sent to you. Um, I really enjoy that educational process and, and the first time, you know, start doing a bit of evens and then you sort of start to step it up and get a bit of a feel for the horse. I, I mean, you can't always, but geez, in those early gallops, you, you usually get a, a little bit of a feel of where they're at and, and where they fit in. And um, I really enjoy that part. And, and I still ride a number of gallops myself. So um, I think it's a model that works for me at the moment. It might have to change down the track. But um, yeah, I mean, I get, I like that hands-on experience to, to know where the horses are at. And, uh, you know, I don't ride the same horses every day. We sort of jump on one here or there. And, and uh, if, you know, something, another rider's reported something that's not quite right, uh, you can get a bit of a feel of it yourself. Peter? 
Let's roll back 18 months. Mitch, obviously you said that the numbers you've got now you're pretty comfortable with and obviously the team works well with the setup you have. But um, there was a huge spike in numbers and it obviously would have been um, probably difficult to get a handle on a lot of used horses when Darren Weir was disqualified. Obviously we sent three or four your way. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just um, something you had to, to get your head around. Um, there was a number of stables placed in a, in a similar situation. Um, you know, I, I'm probably in the boat where I, I like a new challenge and, and uh, a bit of a change up, and, and that influx of numbers probably provided that challenge for me. You know, if we keep lobbing up to work every day and we're doing the same thing over and over again, you, you probably get into a bit of a routine and, and um, I, don't know, I don't know, you... you you lose your zest sometimes, I think. Um, so that challenge was, was probably something that, that I enjoyed and uh, we're certainly looking for new challenges and, and new new uh, initiatives all the time at the moment. Just to, just to add to that, what impressed us, I think we had, it might have been four or five, weren't you? But Ransom Money was one you won races with. Here to Fox is still there, won a couple with. And Captain Harry was probably the... The good story from a 58 to a city midweek city winner, no longer with the stable now, but I think half a dozen winners. And I'm not too sure Darren might be able to help here, but uh, not too many other ex wheel horses went anywhere and won races. So to get half a dozen wins out of those horses was uh, great from our perspective. Yeah, I mean, it, it's probably a bit of a leg up when you'd worked there for so long and you knew the routine. And, and basically, I just followed the routine of what they were in and, and, um, give them a little bit more TLC being in a smaller team and it seemed to work for them. Yep. Darren? Um, right now, um, you've got some nice horses there. Um, where do you see yourself with, um, you know, your spring prospects? Who is there one there that's got you excited? We may or may not have seen it run. Um, are you going to spring full of confidence or as you said earlier, you're very much in that rebuilding phase and you might be looking towards autumn on next year. Yeah, we're, as I said, we're definitely in the rebuild phase. Um, Moonlight Maid misses the spring. Southern Moon misses the spring, but we hope to see both of them in the autumn. Broadway and Fourth runs again, um, you know, either Saturday or Saturday, uh, Saturday week or Saturday fortnight. Um, so those horses are still floating about. There's a, uh, a two-year-old there that's putting his hand up and wanting to get to the races pretty early, I think. And that is Broadway and Fourth's uh, half brother. So he looks like he's forward. And, and um, if you're racing as a two-year-old uh, at this time of year, you're racing down in, in Melbourne. So um, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing him. But um, we're really in that rebuild phase. Um, a lot of these two-year-olds are, are really good sorts. And... Uh, We'll just be patient and, and hopefully see them next spring. You've been a big fan of Poisson Stulum. I guess you've got a few in work. It's unfortunate you two stars are going to miss the spring, but horses are horses. They're not made of steel and things go wrong, but you love the Poisson Stulum breed? Yeah, I mean, he's been a good horse to me uh, in himself and then been a good horse to me now at Stud. So um, we went out and sourced a couple ourselves from the yearling sales this year, one in New Zealand and one over in Adelaide. Um, both really nice types of horses. Um, and, yeah, I mean, he, he's just been a good horse to me. And, and uh, his progeny seem like they've got good motors. So it's only a small crop there next year, so they'll be hard to find. But um, I'm sure in the years down the track, we're going to see plenty of them around. Peter? Yeah, just a quick one with jockeys. Mitch, obviously, you've had an affinity with Jared Fry over the years from a, probably more a country style. But... Your go-to man seems to be Benny Mallum in the city. You've um, obviously that rolls back through Darren Weir days as well, but um, certainly put a lot of faith in Ben. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he's probably rode most of our horses at, at the top level uh, with good success. He's a great rider, um, very good balance and hands, and, and just very smooth on a horse. And uh, you know, I, I tend to like that. And, um, you know, I hate seeing a horse over race. You don't see it happen with Benny very often. And um, he's just a good quality jockey. So, um, you know, he, he's been good to us over the years and uh, we've provided him with some pretty good opportunities along the way. Um, just uh, with uh, with the Poussard Stallone, obviously we've got some horses here now that I might discuss, unless you've got another question there, Darren. Now you go first, Pete. Yeah, obviously, I'll just pair these up. We've got a couple of Dandinos with you. 
um, deep diversion and dandy man. Now we're finding across the board they're taking time and uh, just need to mature. Just give us sort of 10 seconds on each. Uh, yeah, a dandy man. Uh, he's only just been back in probably about a week now. Um, but he all but got to the races last time. He just felt his shins and his knees a little bit. So we decided to give him a break. Nice horse, good brain. Uh, I think he's got potential as a stayer. Um, Deep Diversion has just gone out. He's had an interrupted uh, life as a racehorse all the way along at this stage. So I won't be sort of too hard on him. And um, he's going to, he's heading off for a spring break at the moment. I'll pair these two up. They're half sisters here to Fox and Loudspeaker. Uh, obviously, Fox is just a few little issues at the moment. Loudspeaker, um, oh well, it's come across from another stable jury out. Just a uh, small pace on both of those. Yeah, here to Fox. Um, yeah, she's just battling away with a little bit of soundness issues at the moment. Um, probably the next fortnight is. Uh, real decision time for both of these horses. Um, you know, here to Fox, we're getting deep, sort of getting pretty deep into the breeding season. Um, if she looks like that she's not going to handle the training and, and get back up and racing, I'd be suggesting other routes with her. But um, loudspeakers in the same boat, she needs to sort of shape up and show that she's up to racing in the strong Victorian uh, company and uh, at her next jump out or the following one will be the decision on the and the final two ones um, are Pissons to Loon in Luna Blaze, which we've had there for about a week. Um, just firstly with her. Yep, uh, she's been here about a week. I think I've ridden her most of the days she's been here and she's had one rider on her, other rider on her back. Um, plenty of attitude about her, um, but fits the prototype, big, leggy, athletic, Sort of Philly, um, Southern Moon, Moonlight Bay, very similar builds and shakes. Um, all leg uh, at this age, but they tended to develop very quickly later on in their two-year-old season. So um, we're, we're just looking to give her an educational prep this time around, a bit of evens and uh, a bit of barrier work and uh, not too much pressure, but uh, just get to know our routine and, and get out for a spring break after that. The one you haven't seen and uh, won't for a little while, it's a yearling, toast and start of yearling um, uh, out of a half to social spin and La Passe. Um, yeah, that's one will come your way. Um, first toast and start of line. Yeah, I caught a photo of him the other day. It looks to be a nice sort of style and, and shape of a horse. Um, no doubt we'll see him out at the farm. Um, in the not too distant future, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing what the Toast and start and prodigy can do because he was a very gifted racehorse. Darren. Mitch, um, obviously, there's probably three or four people watching this brief broadcast. Um, <laughs> hopefully, a few more, Pete. Um, you know, maybe a lot of them wouldn't know you. I mean, it's been very difficult this year with COVID 19. Um, you know, we're all got horses. We can't, we can't get to the races. We can't go to the stables. We can't go to the trials. How have you found it personally um, just trying to um, run your business um, with horses and without owners present? Look, I mean, I take my hat on to racing administrators that have been able to keep the racing going. Um, it's been a, a, an amazing effort. Um, I wonder how business will go over the next six to 12 months when everyone starts to feel the effects of being shut down and, and whatever else. Uh, it'll be a bit tricky. I think we'll probably need to, to tread a bit carefully during that time. Um, owners, I think we need to get them back to the races or the stables in some capacity uh, as soon as possible because I can understand that's frustrating for them paying for a service and a hobby that they can't enjoy uh, and obviously some of them it's a business but um, you know, probably a month or, or six weeks ago we started to put together these videos um, of the stables and, and I probably should have done it earlier but uh, you, you sort of get caught up in, in, in work and sometimes forget the bigger picture but um, they're just trying to give an insight and a, and a look into the stables we're trying to, to do more video stuff for the owners and uh, that'll continue you know post all these restrictions but um, it's certainly made us take a step back, uh, probably 
change things around a, a little bit as far as the business goes. And um, I tell you, it's been one bonus. There's not many people having sick days and not getting the flu at the moment. <laughs> and what about race day? What's it like going to Flemington or Caulfield or Mooney Valley? And what's it feel like being there without any crowd or any owners? Um, just you and the jockeys and the administrators, really. I suppose um, we've grown to get used to it a little bit. Um, I know um, Manicato night, I was down there um, when the filly of Kieran Mars won, won that. And um, you, know, you can sort of hear them jumping and, and yelling and screaming, two or three of them. And, and it was just a very, very eerie sort of a feeling. But um, we've probably grown used to it a little bit. But I can't wait to you know, get the atmosphere back at the races. I know during the week, you probably don't get that many people there, but on a Saturday and, and whatever else, you know, that atmosphere and, and catching up with people, it's, uh, I think, something that people really, really desire and, and uh, take a, a great benefit out of, uh, you know, in their social life. So, um, you know, I, I just know even a, a Saturday at Flemington, you know, all the members that get down there and, and they all sort of know each other and come from different parts. And uh, I think people will be really missing that. And uh, I can't wait to see them back there. Peter? Yeah, just generic question here. Mitch, I know you said you love to be part of a young horse as it comes through the stable from early days through to a race horse. But is there any preference with stayers or sprinters training? Yeah, look, I, I get this question a lot. I probably, my career would suggest that uh, I enjoy training the, training the stayers more and, and it's probably right. Um, I've got a theory where those stays, you can get them in form and you can probably, or, or a mile plus, you can probably get them in form and, and uh, get them to outperform their ability. Um, where the sprinters, if they're not fast enough, they're not fast enough. It, it, it makes it tricky, you know. Um, I find that anyway, but um, yeah, probably lean towards the stayers. I'm, I'm done. You're done, Pete. Well, I, I guess my final question that I, um, I ask everyone, Mitch, is... Um, What's the race you want to win? I mean, is it the Melbourne Cup or is it something else? Well, maybe I can say you can pick two races. <laughs> There's a last race at Geelong today that I would like to win. That's probably the most, <laughs> most foremost. Um, look, I've probably got a small handful of them. Um, I would love to win the Geelong Cup, being the, being the hometown. Um, yeah. I would love to win the Cox Plate because I think it's the ultimate atmosphere and ultimate test. You know, you love seeing those horses get set alight at the half mile and, and contest is on. Um, but I really, I, I probably lit the flame there with, with the Derby um, last year and uh, it's something I, I would like to, to win. So uh, that's my small handful and hopefully one day we can win one of them, if not all of them. Well, I know um, I've been lucky enough to win the Warrnambool Cup with True Corsa and we went very close with Yogi and that was my hometown cup. Now, I made a promise to Liz that uh, we need to win the Geelong Cup because she comes from Geelong. So, do you think we can do it together? Well, uh, if we keep throwing the darts at the wall, eventually we'll hit, I reckon. It's something we've probably got to look into a little bit more. I, I mean, I was speaking to some of my staff the other day. I've never actually had an international since I've started training. So uh, I think to win those feature staying races in the spring to heighten your chances, you probably need those horses. And it's probably something that we need to start to target and uh, look further into. There's a bloody well, bit. I've never heard one. <laughs> well, I think he's, I think he's right. I think, I think we need to find... a front-running, tough stayer that handles firm ground and uh, set it for the Geelong Cup together. That's good. All right. I'm All right, Mitch, well, I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, hold, on, hold on, I've got one little thing. I've just, your background, Mitch, grandfather of bookmaker. I think your dad might have worked under your grandfather. Um, as a horse trainer, setting a horse, is there extra mayonnaise when you have a bit of a bet and the plan comes off? Obviously there is. There certainly is, but I tell you what, I've got a horrible record of running second when trying to do that, so <laughs> I've nearly given up on it. Are we do we do we lob on this thing in the last of Geelong? If it's 
better than a soft seven, yes. Don't worry, because there's only me and Darren know about this, because this won't go in <laughs> until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, Pete's got to Pete's got to have it. Yeah, I'm going to have it a run in second too. So don't worry, Mitch. <laughs> I'll let you wind it up, Darren. <laughs> All right. Well, Mitch. Well, Mitch. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, pleasure to have you on. It's a pleasure to be involved with you and your stable. Um, I summarise Mitch Friedman as one of as a young trainer coming through, but. I think he's got an old head on his shoulders. He reminds me very much of um, a number of trainers I've dealt with over the years that are pretty much old school in the way that they go about it. You know, attention to detail, always at the stables, ride a lot of work, and the horse comes first. And um, more and more these days, I see a number of what I call corporate trainers, you know, with big teams around them. And um, I, I must admit, I'm, now that I've got a few Ks on the clock myself, I, I like these trainers that are very much hands-on and they know your horse and they can tell you where your horse is at. And um, I recommend strongly to our clients out there that you should have at least a share in one horse with this stable because I think it's a stable going places. Terrific people doing a terrific job. Thanks a lot, Mitch. Thanks very much for the kind yeah. words and uh, thanks for having me on. Good we'll see you soon. No worries. Good on you. Good, thanks, good luck in the last. Thanks.